It is um, a great pleasure to introduce Professor Marina Warnam. Not, of course, that she needs any introduction. Her work on feminism, myth, and iconicity is internationally renowned. To mention just two of her most celebrated texts, Alone of All Her Sex, Myth, and the Cult of the Virgin Mary, Joan of Arc, The Image of Female Heroism. Her work of nonfiction is, of course, accompanied by her work as a novelist and short story writer. Her novel, The Lost Father, was on the Booker Prize shortlist. She is Professor of English and Creative Writing at Birkbeck College. Her work, and this is just one aspect of her work, is characterized by the profundity and the intellectual power of its analysis of how ideas, myths, and stories travel, how they are translated through time and across media, how they transform cultures, and how they transform intercultural contact. Her work exposes and deconstructs Orientalist, Orientalist thinking at all levels. And also, it, it, it demonstrates um, how literary practice and critical methodology are intimately and inseparately intertwined. To mention two of her most recent texts, Stranger Magic, Charmed States and the Arabian Nights, Once Upon a Time, a short history of the fairy tale. And this is only to give a small um, uh, part of um, uh, Marina's uh, imposing achievements. It's not to mention, for example, the role that she performs as public intellectual and the range and sophistication of the work that she does for many reviews, but in particular for the LRB, the London Review of Books, that is so familiar to so many of us. She is, at the moment, engaged in a project um, based in Palermo that is looking at storytelling and refugee communities. Her title this evening is Travelling Stories, Vicissitudes of Arabesque. It is work in progress that Marina is keen to share with us. I might add just anecdotally that before we, a few days before we got the grant um, for transnationalizing modern languages, Jenny, Loredana and I had dinner with Marina at the British um, Comparative Literary Association and indeed that was a perfect training for the interview that we had a few days later. So, Marina, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Charles, um, and uh, for that very generous introduction, uh, but also for inviting me, because I really am rather an interloper, and as a result, I've been learning a wonderful amount and been <coughs> extremely stimulated and stretched by what I've heard, and also frustrated at the parallel sessions, which means I've only been able to hear one set of papers at one time. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, Hannah Arendt wrote that stories are a form of action, and the way that we insert ourselves in the human world. This was in the human condition in 1958. She also added, the ability to produce stories is the way we become historical. Now, traveling stories can be ones we carry ourselves with us as we go, or they can pass almost autonomously as if they were themselves sentient beings from one person to another one group to another, across barriers, even linguistic and certainly ide ideological. Cultures are richly packed with traveling stories, transplanted, revisioned, metamorphing. All traveling stories can be stories about traveling, by those who are on the road, those who stay behind, and then those who let them go, and by the aravants and the leave takers, the departing, and the parted. It's a cliche to say that we're the stories we tell, but this conference has heard some lively arguments about labeling, and label, labels are active segments of stories, and motors of their larger meanings. Um, my, the, tra the traveling stories, of course, is a nod, a homage to Edward Said, who wrote marvelously about traveling texts. And I've taken the subtitle from another great 
uh, writer of literature and, um, and writer on literature, like Said, who's Italo Calvino, um, who writes in an essay on La Fiaba, the tale, the same word as fairy tale in Italian, um, uh, um, this vicissitudes of arabesque. Um, and he proposes reading fantastic literature, which includes fairy tales, by attending to their metaphorical fabric. He writes, rather than being considered an ornament that adorns the fundamental interweaving of plot, subplots, and narrative functions, metaphors move these forward into the foreground as the true substance of the text, bordered by the arabesque threadwork of fabulous vicissitudes. So if that's filiforme arabesco delle peripezie fabulative in Italian. So in this talk, um, I'm going to make some remarks on reorienting the relationship between Italy and Africa, especially Egypt, under the sign of the metaphor as arabesque. Um, and I'll first, um, sorry, um, and the, uh, the area used to be known as the Levant, and I'll make, so, make some comments about the Levant, the place of the rising sun or the east in relation to the Occident, the place of the setting sun. It's a term that fell under a heavy colonial and even racist shadow, but there are signs that it's being recuperated along similar lines to the claiming of negative labeling in other contested spheres, such as virago and even slut for women. I'll try and chart the historic minglings and correspondence between the dominant cultures in the region once known as the Levant by looking at them as a form of interlaced and honeycombed imbrications of varied elements, rather than as instances of discrete, separate bulwarks ranged one against the other. So I think here you see how um, Calvino's um, idea that metaphor was not just ornament on top, but was actually part of the structure is, is, held, is enfleshed by the arabesque, where figure and ground keep flipping. You can't see which is the top and which is the bottom. Um, secondly, under the sign of arabesque, oh, sorry, let me just show you the, the, co the contrasting. So that's uh, Mondriale, uh, where you actually get a sort of com a co a conflation of Christian Cosmati work, very familiar in Rome, uh, with arabesque um, uh, tiling and tessellations. Um, all varied, every single square is different, um, every single set of patterns is different across a vast extent of the floor, a great wonder of the world, which you must see if you haven't already. Um, and uh, Arab workmen worked on it at the time. I want to contrast it with this kind of border. So you've got the interweaving, the intrecciamento of arabesque against this an idea of a border. We'll get rid of that. This is the... This is the most beautiful latest development of arabesque, which are the, is the tiling of the new mathematical building in um, Oxford. Secondly, under this sign of the intercalated arabesque, I'll offer some thoughts on reading the work of writers in the region, with a special focus on Fausta Celente, who, though born in Cagliari in 1898, grew up in her mother's hometown, the famously polyglot cosmopolitan city of Trieste. She chronicles the seething atmosphere of moneyed families and their conventional repression, especially of women, the tense political irredentism of the period from the 1880s onwards, and the rich bourgeois culture in her last novel, Le Quattro Ragazze Wieselberger, which was published in 1976 and won the Strega that year. I'm not going to be talking about that. Cosmopolitan, multi-ethnic, urban Trieste prepared Fausta Talente for her life in Egypt from 1921 to 1947, where many languages were also spoken and where many allegiances also jostles, jostled and sparked off one another, and a form of cultural polyglot sophistication in glamoured society, especially in retrospect, and where extremes of wealth and poverty, excesses of luxury and squalor, antiquity and modernity divided groups within their own kinships and tribal ancestries, and where, during the rise of fascism in Europe, the loyalties of the Egyptians made the country a crucial arena of diplomacy and military strategy. A Triestina who lived in Egypt and then in Kuwait and in England, she died in Dorset in 1994, Chalente did not see herself as belonging to one culture. Mi domando, she writes in 1976, se d'italiano o solo la lingua, e anche quella per caso, mi sento straniera dappertutto. 
And that's from the preface she wrote in 1976 to her collection of stories from the 1930s. Her young female protagonist, Daniela of Balata Levantina, which I heard a wonderful paper about today by Ariana Fognina, Fognina? So, um, um, uh, returns to Italy and finds her way of speaking attracts comment. She's fluent in Italian, but not quite entirely native. This is exactly what happened to my own southern Italian mother. Um, she, she was complimented in later life when she went to Italy on the fluency of her Italian. Um, and um, in many ways, I can read my mother's displacement to Egypt and her life as a her transplantation into British culture um, through the works of Charente, or at least I've tried to do that. Egypt was in fact under British rule from the embassy in Cairo, though nominally a protectorate. The allegiance of the young King Farouk was a high stake in the power games, and he seemed perilously attracted now and then to fascism, and was attended at court by several Italians close to the regime. There's a joke about this, that the British ambassador, who was married to an Italian, um, and um, this is reported in Artemis Cooper's and Anthony Beaver's excellent book about the British in Cairo, that His Excellency, the British ambassador, demanded that the king dismiss the Italians around him, whereupon Farouk re retorted that he would comply when the ambassador rid himself of his Italian. <laughs> this talk will be itself a branching structure, inlaid with coloured and glinting elements that I hope will catch your attention and give you pleasure. And among these mosaic pieces will be some of the books my mother brought with her when she left her home town of Bari in Puglia to marry my father and settle in Cairo. The clutch is meager. It includes cuore, but in some cases, the writers are so forgotten that they don't even turn up in any search engine so far, which is quite saying something, actually. I've never known Google to be defeated, but it's defeated, perhaps you can fill me in, it's defeated by Ita Baraldi. Um, but in some arbitrary way, they might give a further sense of traveling stories and the arabesque forkings and arcs of culture um, by glancing at these disparate titles that she seems to have chosen to keep with her when she left Italy forever, as it turned out. The Levant is, a, as a term, um, lost ground because, as I mentioned, it's associated with the belated imperial administrations that supplanted the Ottoman Empire and no longer applied to a region newly mapped according to independent, bounded, and distinct nation states, fiercely claiming their separate identities. And that's the case even if they were within imperial regimes. But the term also, uh, uh, European uh, um, regimes. But the, ter in t the term also acquired strongly Orientalist overtones. I haven't checked if Ian Fleming uses it of the spectral enemies he raises in the James Bond books, but early Graham Greene, who was keeping closely to the lurid tradition of empire adventure fiction, draws on the associations for his, villain, for ex for his villains, for example, the Smyrna merchant in Stambul train. Um, Andalusia has itself become a byword for the kind of harmony and diversity, the mix that is for harmony and diversity, for a mix that is fertile while fissive. But there are other times and places where something similar has happened, and one of the richest and most special is narrative, a figurative place. In stories, people have come together using their imaginations to embroider a common tapestry, to explore tensions and conflicts and dreams and hopes, to lay out rules of conduct and to test the limits of convention, to work out ethics. The shores, harbors, port cities, and islands of Italy figure in stories without special comment from the storytellers of many different cultures. This is the given geography of many tales known to the narrator and audience alike. Sometimes the names of the places are fanciful. For example, does the tale of the Prince of the Black Isles from the Arabian Nights allude to the volcanic sands and pumice of the Aeolian chain of Pantelleria and the Tunisia? Do the beautiful orchards and gardens of the fairy archipelagos, also in the Arabian Nights, for instance, where Hassan of Basra is rescued by the seven fairy daughters of the king of the blue jinn, do these islands recall such paradisal places in Sicily, Elba, and Gozo? These are, there are, they are imaginary other realms, as fairy lands are, 
but their features capture something Mediterranean, the qualities that now draw thousands of holidaymakers, and, and they're inscribed very deeply in, in, the, um, in, in this material that I'm arguing has a very long temporality in culture. The adjective Levantine and English tongue can also carry strains of anti-Semitism. And in fact, Ruth ben Giat very rightly commented that the term is often used so as not to seem anti-Semitic. It's used as a cover for anti-Semitic thought or speech. Um, and it's joined with racism against blacks and Arabs likewise, and an unexamined assumption of superiority to all Mediterranean peoples in the broadest sense, including Italians. Indeed, the ambitions of the Daesh Caliphate, harking back to the glories of the Abbasid and Umayyad empires, as well as to the Ottomans, revives a dream of borderless extent, united by faith and language. The dissolution of internal borders of this imagined territory speaks of imperial ambitions, and it becomes tainted in the 20s and 30s by the equally pan-global enterprises of Italian fascism, which Mussolini dreamed would resurrect the Roman Empire in Africa and the Balkans. My mother, oh, I should have, sorry, I'll go back to that. That's another example from Mondadiani. So, and that's from Cairo, just to give you a sense of this uh, arabesque constellations. Um, yeah. So. My mother was born in Molfetta in 1922, the year um, Mussolini came to power, as you know. She married my father, an English officer in the Eighth Army, in 1844. In 1944. <laughs> um, and um, I was born in 1946. Um, when they had gone to Cairo, and he opened a bookshop there. There's my mother in Ravello there. Just the German line had just retreated. This, there was almost the first week after this was, you could actually, and my father in his letters says that he was able to drive there for the first time. The Germans were just north of there. Um, so he opened a bookshop, and um, I was six when we left Egypt. I'm oh, sorry, I was six months when we went to Egypt. So this is the bookshop. Um, remembered still by some old people in Cairo. And there I am um, with our, in our colonial setting. Um, one of the books, my, one, this is the first book my, that I'm mentioning to you, that my mother carried with her to Egypt, is called Le Glorie di Casa Savoia, published in Florence in 1937, year 15 of the fascist regime. My mother was 15 years old that year, two years after Mussolini had ordered the invasion of Ethiopia in a war of unparalleled brutality, which is saying something. The book hosannas the ruling dynasty and hails the king as emperor of Ethiopia. It includes photographs of all the Popinjay princes of the House of Savoy, fulsomely captioned with their new dukedoms. And this would seem comic if it weren't also ghastly, and of Maresciallo Badoglio as Duke of Abbas Ababa and of Mussolini in his medals as Fondatore d'Impero. In this, this, in this kind of triumphalist and fantastic delusion, during such ruthless and unfettered drives towards expansion, a pan-cultural term like Levantinismo would certainly be suspect. Why did Ilia keep this book, this empty vein and embarrassing trace of an Italy that she turned her back on? It bears some scribble marks in red crayon, mine probably, when I was a tra child, um, so it shows she didn't treasure it that much. She would remember, or quite often, rather bemusedly, how they all rejoiced at the great victory over, the Ethi over Ethiopia. They, she came from a modest household, and they knew very little. She could still sing the song, Faceta Nera, Bella Vicinia, and in the late 80s, when I was writing a novel set in the period in Puglia, I tried to discover the history of the song, and I drew a blank. Actually, this is the days before Google, and I haven't tried it on Google, but it was very difficult to find it in any encyclopedia or history, what, what, how the song came to be. Um, she learned frugality all through the war years, and she rarely threw anything away, even in the days of prosperity. Besides, she respected books and book learning, and she remained a loyal monarchist later to the English crown. The volume gives a full genealogy and a full portrait gallery of the House of Savoy. But my mother also kept a certain respect for the Italian royal family, and she followed the news of their fallen fortunes, especially the women's, in the pages of Oggi, the photo magazine that arrived with fascinating chronicles of heartache, car crashes, and exciting new hopes of love or of babies, and of the latest miracles at Lourdes, bleeding statues of the Virgin Mary, the canonization of Maria Goretti, and Pope Pius XII's good deeds. 
I don't know how Levantin or Levantino now sounds in French or indeed in Italian, but judging from Fausta Talente's use of it, the rustle of contempt stirs in it, and she twists it for her own trenchant purposes, as I'll go to later. Yet the terms Levant and Levantine appear to be returning to neutrality today. I think I missed one, sorry. Did this, am I going backwards? What am I doing? Oh, sorry. No, I don't think so. That's, so I think that's as much. So this is them as, as children. Um, um, evoking the, so Levantine um, is becoming again a useful descriptive geographical and historical term, evoking the union of heterogeneous peoples and their cultures, if not in harmony, at least in rich interactions and cross fertilization. For example, in an article published in 2006, the literary scholar Tiziana Carlino explored the question, the Levant, a trans-Mediterranean category, and, and read Fausta Talente's fiction and the essays of the Egyptian-born Israeli, Jacqueline Shohet Kahanov, while the splendidly wide-ranging and imaginative Belgian scholar, Sophie Bache, in an article called Le Rendez-vous des étrangers um, on Marxist and anarchist Alexandria, um, reconfigures ideas about the modern city's mixed fusion culture through its many Jewish thinkers and writers, writing in many languages, Greek, Romanian, Ladino. Both Carlino and Bash also remember Italians, who aren't of Jewish origin or allied to Judaic beliefs. Most famously, Ungaretti. Ungaretti left his native Alessandria in 1912, first for France and then later for his parents' country, Italy. He wrote a poem of farewell, a very famous poem for those of you, I'm sure you all know it, called Levante. He's leaving the shores of Alexandria and he begins to cross the sea. The Levante materializes in the indeterminacy of sea, shore, and sky, a no man's land and a place of transition with the world being left behind. Not so much a space, however, even a liminal space, but more of a temps perdu, a lost time. The Greek poet Seferis, I'm sorry, my, the Greek poet, poet George Seferis captures this with abrasive fury and despair in his wartime journals, which have been edited and translated by Roderick Beaton and published in 2007 under the title, not Seferis' own title, a Levant journal. Seferis' record of his period of exile and misery in the Middle East reveals how Levant has become an almost neutral historical term, I feel, for a shell that has been emptied. A shell because the people who were living there existed in an ambiguous relation to the region. They belonged there and yet they did not belong there. Fasta Chalente, reminiscing about her e years in Egypt, mourns the passing of quel molle ritmo di vita tra Levantino e coloniale thus drawing an implicit distinction between Levantine and colonial, because the Italians, like the Greeks, did not fall neatly into the colonial categories of ruler and subject, but outside them. They were not natives, even when they had been born there. The Levant as a literary category does not set out to exclude Arabs by design, but they are not usually caught up in the embrace of the term. An Arab poet is not included in it, but a Jewish poet who writes in Arabic might be. The term is elusive, it is sensitive, it is nuanced by considerations that often, tactfully, bashfully, embarrassedly, remain unvoiced. Displacement, cosmopolitanism, hover around it. In Levantine writers' representations, the Arabs themselves are muted, effaced. While as for the writers themselves, Levantine is not a description used from an Egyptian writer like Naguib Mafus or a Libyan like Ibrahim al Kuni. Levantine denotes strangers in a strange land that is nevertheless familiar territory to them, indeed home to them. Their alienated state depend deepens in relation to shifting political power and cultural values. Ungaretti recalls Syrians leaving on the boat with him. A poppa emigranti soriano ballano. Another, um, um, another, uh, sorry, another book that my mother um, still had with her amongst her things when she died is Carmelo Colamonicos. Um, let me just see where I am in this PowerPoint. No, that's okay. I'll leave it there. Um, so I don't have a photograph of this book because I'm afraid I simply couldn't find it in my when I was making the, the pictures of the books for this talk. So I have my notes on it, but it's gone missing for the moment. 
Carmelo Colamonico, Paesi e Popoli della Terra, della terra Antologia Geografica per la Scuola Media, L'Europa, um, published in Milan in 1941, year 19, of fascist, fascism. It's the first printing, um, and th th there's many, many photographs of sawmills, bulb fields and greenhouses, lakes and fjords and deltas, wonders of the old world, Cologne Cathedral, the Alcazar, high points of modern ingenuity, the ironwork bridge at Oporto, the covered market in Hamburg, a snowplow locomotive in Sweden, the new parliament building in Helsinki, diagrams and maps, including one which shows Rome as the center of Europe and the Middle East. It was year 19 of the fascist era, three years only to go before Italy's defeat and the end of the fascist dreams of Imperium. My mother, Ilia, was 18 or 19 when the book came out, and she'd left school almost 10 years before, at the time her father died. Her sisters, especially Beatrice, the one closest to her in age, took over the responsibility of teaching her. The book is stitched and falling apart, but was once bound in soft gray covers. Here and there, a small cross in ink marks a passage that has been read. And approved, can't tell. She was homeschooled, as the saying goes, and this was one of the textbooks that the girls must have studied side by side during the first years of the war. She was reading it, one imagines, since it was published in 1941, while the British were fighting the Italians in the Horn of Africa and on the north coast of the continent during the siege of Tobruk and afterwards. 1944 and the liberation of southern Italy and Puglia, which would bring my father to Bari to marry her, wasn't yet imaginable. So unpredictable did the outcome then seem for the Allies and their armies. Colamonico's book is a serious work of Italian fascist world vision without self-consciousness or arrière-pensée. The, the Duce's glory suffuses the pages while Mussolini was invading Albania in pursuit of his vision of the new, renewed imperial Rome. The second chapter, called The Mediterranean in Italy, shows signs of, I'm going to get back to the children because this is when they were reading it. There we are. Um, the second chapter, called The Mediterranean in Italy, shows signs of attentive, approving, disapproving reading, with many little inked crosses and pencil underlinings of passages, in which Colamonico, the conscientious geographer of his time, invokes the unity of the countries that border on the Mediterranean basin in terms that suggest deeper affinities than simply physical and geographical identity. The same scenery, he writes, accompanies the two banks of the Suez Canal, which is su su situated between Asia and Africa. Later, in a section discussing the political expansion of Italy into the Mediterranean and the conquest of Libya in 1911-12, to 12, this textbook of the regime's last decade surveys complacently the pervasive spread of Italianità through the region. Libya, Albania, Malta, the Balkans, Tunisia, Morocco, Corsica, the map is colored, not pink, the chosen color of the British, but imperial purple. The author focuses especially on the crucial importance of Libya in withstanding England's influence on North Africa and Egypt. It appears as a key to power in the region, the crucial bridgehead offering Italy the chance of wresting control of the Suez Canal in the east and to Upper Egypt in the south. Colamonico was a specialist um, in South Italian geography, and he actually was a local um, Pugliese, so it's possible the book sort of came because he was known in the region. And he was elected to the Accademia dei Vincei in the 60s. He may have been an ordinary survivor, an abidable type, giving, merely giving a conscientious schoolmasterly account of the conventional views of the time and in that place. He writes down his information. Her irony heaps on irony, as if the god of the passing years were laughing up his sleeve or capering with mischievous glee. For as he writes, and the teenage Ilia read, the vision of Africa orientale italiana was under attacks so that would prove terminal. The Allies gradually, empirically, but nevertheless effectively, were beginning to turn the fortunes of war to their advantage in the course of the Western Desert Campaign. Colamonico must have put the finishing touches to his geography book before the long assault of the Germans and Italians on the port of Tobruk began, in what became a grinding and terrible protracted siege and a critical turning point of the Second World War. The Allies, by managing to hold the town at last, prevented Rommel's advance on Egypt and cut off German easier access to supplies of oil there and to the wealth of Cairo. Tobruk was perseveringly defended by Australians for grim days and weeks and months, and then by Czechs and Poles and British troops who took over. The siege lasted over five months 
by the end of it, making it one of the longest ever in history, probably not our since Aleppo. But the decisive relief came when the Eighth Army joined the defenders after marching from the west. Esmond Warner was one of the soldiers driving east along the shore in his jeep with his Batman Prestridge. France and England, says Colamonica, have considered the Mediterranean their history during recent decades. Bitterly, he lists their military installations, warehouses, and their disregard for the local inhabitants, for their health and their economic advancement. The need for Italian influence is clear, he states. Italians understand, for example, the fight against malaria. Here, Colamonico takes refuge in another words and quotes from a book called The Economy of Tomorrow, also appearing in 1941. The presence of Italy in the Mediterranean is therefore, as it once was in the past centuries of the time of Rome, the first reason for its rapid and full civil evolution. There is a vigorous black cross against this paragraph, but I don't think this means that Elia was challenging the thought. Maybe her sister Beatrice was signaling that she should read that, reach that bit and take note. Maybe she was making a mark to say she had. In the pages that follow about Northern Europe, a few signs of interest surface until we, until we reach some new underlinings in pencil. Only the second time this occurs in the book. They make these comments on the English. Old customs and old practices of every kind, old formulae from the time of the Normans, are maintained in public and in private life. The civil and penal codes are nothing but an undigested mass of examples and sentences accumulated over centuries. This conservative spirit, like respect for law and abhorrence of lies, which have been so much vaunted as the English character, are demonstrated more by not violating the form and the letter than by the spirit of substance. Sorry, not, not violating the form of the letter, but violating the spirit of substance. Colamonico goes on. The Englishman is not industrious, nor thrifty. On the contrary, he has a curious tendency to idleness, to free spending his money, and is a lover of living it up. London is not beautiful in the sense that our cities are beautiful. The English countryside has been defined, not without reason, as a single park made and kept for lords. He says, if you look out of the window in an English train, what you will see is all private land. My mother's wavering pencil lines underscore these phrases, which in a perverse way would be exactly borne out by her experience of England and by my father, who was sadly all of those things really, idle and free spending and fond of living it up, and would so like to have owned lordly acres of his own. So he was on his way to Cairo, where for the first time he would find such fun as seemed to be faded from the whole world as he let the city open its hands to let fall a prodigality of pleasures. The city was, he wrote in 1943, after spending there his second leave, sorry, after spending his leave there, it, Cairo is my second home. The Levant is returning as a potentially significant destination designation because our current strife-torn era has added sharp salience to the multiple manifestations of diaspora. The Levant is complex, and it does not only convey a dream of pan-imperial erasure, swallowing up different peoples and allegiances. It communicates a state of internal diaspora. It is laden with knowledge of exile, experience of diasporic culture before the peoples making it have been dispersed. Perhaps transnational is the more just, or hyponational, below national allegiances, no longer tainted by association with global reach and clearly disassociated from empires dedicated to ethnic cleansing. The old Levant has gained in stature, creolized, polyglot, apatrida, aligned with the nomadic and the stateless. Later, after all the ghastly grinding um, flight has come to a tem temporary rest in Jerusalem, George Seferis writes down his despair. Here in the Middle East, as it's called, we're sinking all the time. We're not people anymore, we're exiles. And we don't share the same exile. There are as many conditions of exile as there are of us. We're the crew of a ship that's gone down, each one fighting for his life, each one separately astride his own piece of flotsam. In August, after the decisive Allied victory at Alamein, the evacuees from Egypt returned there, and Seferis, in his furious, misanthropic, grieving fashion, resumed his struggles on behalf of the Greek government in exile. Once it becomes descriptive of a time lost, a homeland forsaken, the Levant gains in evocativeness, in a nostalgic charge. It is a doomed place, and the Levantines know the writing is on the wall for them. Fasta Talente repeats how well they knew this. 
It was just a question of time. She is vicious about her own tribe. I was among the few people, the very few people indeed, who considered Levantinism an old fibroma incrostato, I don't quite know how to translate it, an old fibroma encrusting the whole of the Middle East and destined to disappear, a phenomenon that contrary to what people um, maintained had brought no good to the country and its inhabitants, while Europeans and Levantines enjoyed conditions partly created by themselves, which made daily life incredibly sweet and easy. I saw, I saw instead, she continues, how atrocious was that misery of a people so gentle and so peaceable. In her writings, the Arab inhabitants, the Felayin, stand at the edge of her Levantine character's consciousness, their shadows moving in the wings, rarely seen and more often overheard, in the sounds of drying and playing, or shouting and singing or working, caught by the Levantine principles, protagonists, as they go about, their, they go to bed in the heat of the afternoon, for example. Chalente stages some fierce, compassionate reactions to this state of affairs. Um, in Balata Levantina, the indolent, cynical Matteo nevertheless tells with Daniela, but Egypt, Daniela, is the fella. It's him with his donkey and his bundle of clover, who's been the same for 2,000 years. For you, for he's never done anything, but so, so for him, no one has ever done anything for 2,000 years. Um, and so he says, and when they meet in the street, the, the car of the pasha and the fella on his, on his uh, donkey, they don't see each other. These are two worlds which go to and don't ever meet. But she's also keen to reveal in her fiction how threadbare and harsh were the conditions for so many of the immigrants likewise. Pasto Chalente married Enrico Terni, a composer from a Jewish family, in 1921. They left Italy that year for Egypt and joined the Italian community in Alexandria, which will become her fiction's focus of attention as individuals, dissidents, refugee Jews, bohemians, intellectuals opposed to Mussolini's regime gathered in what was then, in, in what was then a, a small community that grew and grew. Chalente and her husband were opposed to fascism long before the racial laws were passed by Mussolini's regime, and her brother, a star of stage and screen, a successful and celebrated, was run down by a German vehicle as he was coming out of the theater where he just performed in Rome in November, 20, on, in November 43, a matter of weeks before the German retreat. Looking back with hindsight, Chalente thanked her lucky stars that she'd lived outside Italy for the entire span of the fascist period. But her characters in her fiction and short stories are conscious of its encroachment and their endangered state. Her relationship to her new country was highly ambivalent. She was aware of its suffocating social caste system, of the squalor and pettiness of so many lives there, and she sets them down mercilessly in the stories she began writing when she was living in Alexandria and then later in Cairo, and also published there in a literary, in a literary magazine, the Giornale d'Oriente, which actually Joseph Viscomi characterized as a fascist magazine. Um, I haven't seen it yet because it's not available in the English library, and um, I would be very surprised if it was marked. The stories I have absolutely no mark of pro-fascist feeling in them. Um, so um, anyway, the stories collected in Interno Configure in 1967, but all written in, in the 30s, bring strikingly before us the varied population of immigrants and emigres from the glamorous, hedonistic, and often fabulously wealthy Greek and Jewish business dynasties in their marvelous villas to the more unexpected to us wretched artisan workers fleeing greater misery in their home countries and scraping by in a huddled hovel um, in the Alexandrian suburb as or, or on the beach. Um, as in her famous book, Cortile a Cleopatra, which was written in 1931. Um, so um, I'm not going to repeat anything about Balata Levantina because actually there was a, Ariana spoke so wonderfully about it. Um, but in every social circle she attended to in her writing, Chalente records political ferment and listens in to adherents of different views. Um, she was sometimes presented to the public as an orientalist, and the atmosphere of her narratives is suffused with the heat and smells of Egypt, the cooing of doves and the lapping of the sea, the pleasures of the breezes and the flowers and the fruits. But the tone is somber and often acerbic. 
She was writing and publishing at the same time as Lawrence Durrell and evoking similar events, the war in Egypt, but she's caustic and cool and skeptical and deliberately resists romanticization and luxurious spectacle. And though she's, de and though she's deeply concerned with women's self-reliance and the stifling of their freedoms, her approach is melancholy, with a strong and often despairing sense of identification with women's lives and the limits against which they're struggling. She took a highly active part in anti fascist resistance in Cairo, um, broadcasting daily from 1940 to 1943 on Radio Cairo, a daily bulletin directed at the prisoners of wars, war, Italian prisoners of war who'd been taken by the Allies. Um, this uh, whole area desperately needs um, exploration and research, and there's a wonderful deposit of her papers, all her wartime diaries, and all her scripts for the broadcasting that has been put in the archive in Pavia, Maria Corti archive in Pavia, which is definitely absolutely crying out for someone to pay attention to. Um, and um, so, um, now, Seferis's journals, kept at the same time as Chalente was living in Cairo, um, capture a similar material wretchedness and weariness of the spirit. He records intermittently the exhausting struggle he was having with the British protectors of Egypt. In Chalente and Seferis, the English do not come out well. Um, uh, and after the Italians had invaded and taken Greece, in 1942, when Rommel appeared to be advancing triumphantly towards Cairo through the northern desert, Sir Ferris and his wife were ordered to leave, along with hundreds of others who were endangered by their allegiance to the Allies, and join a terrifying exodus of hundreds eastwards across the canal. They cross it on a bridge of barges and are waiting for a train. It's July. The heat is infernal. There's no food and little water. Though they're kept in ignorance, Jerusalem, under the British mandate in Palestine, will be their destination. Seferis sees an elderly woman huddled to one side, talking to a friend from Alexandria. She was crying loudly. He begins talking to her. Their language in common is French. I'm quite strong, she said, but my body can't take any more. Seferis sits himself down beside her. Are you French, I asked her. No, she says, je suis italienne antifasciste. She then tells, sorry, it's in French in the original, it's important. She then tells him that she was married to a fascist who knew the leaders of the fascist movement personally. But, I, but she goes on, I could never understand why they did the awful things they did. Her brother was also against the fascists, like herself, she goes on, but she had left her daughter behind with her young children. The reported conversation ends, oh, what an awful thing. And Sir Ferris confides in his diary that when he then told her his own story and hoped that it consoled her to hear another's troubles. Among the books my mother brought to Egypt is a, I think she bought it in, sorry, my, my, among the books my, my mother bought in Egypt is a small French-Italian dictionary, very battered and patched together now. It carries the stamp of the bookshop, Le Papyrus, so she needed it before my father's bookshop was up and running. That is, immediately on arrival in Cairo, where the lingua franca of much of the community was still French. I remember once overhearing someone praise my father's fluency and comment with a chuckle on his Levantine accent. French was still the language of the diplomacy, of the prosperous Coptic community, and of the educated snobbish elite, of those who dressed from fabrics made by dressmakers, but fabrics bought at the resplendent department stores, Galerie Lafayette, Chichurel. Many other languages, Turkish, Farsi, Greek, Ladino, and Italian, were also part of the lingua franca, the mesh of <coughs> several different communities living together there at the time. The British prided themselves then on their European polish, on their autant. At home, my parents spoke to each other in English and sometimes in Italian, but their English was sprinkled with Gallicisms. The use of French terms was intended to add class. It included words for social structures and types, very well known, bourgeois, le gratin, le beau monde, for nuances of character and occupation, soubrette, aventurier, demi-mondaine, grande horizontale. It made snobbishness sound sophisticated and naturalized it by setting its dictates in the language of urban enlightenment culture, gilded by association with Paris, the metropole of taste and savoir-faire. In this dandyish macaronic, which my parents adopted until my mother's death eight years ago, she would say disapprovingly, oh, she suffers from such nostalgie de la boue, or more enviously, she's a jolie laird, but still she has a je ne sais quoi. Anyway, I can now read as if in a faded and stained etiquette manual, etiquette itself being one of these French terms, a whole world of relations and values. 
Trois prononcée was a favorite phrase, especially for women with opinions, often used of myself at the breakfast table. I picked up Arabic, childish Arabic, but complex with snobberies, twisted attitudes to the language itself, a dismal state of affairs that inflicted deep, deep, long scars. Edward Said tells the story in his memoir, Out of Place, about meeting a tennis coach in the United States who was of Arab descent, had lived in Cairo and spoke Arabic. Said tried to engage him in their shared mother tongue, only to be hushed, no brother, no Arabic here. I left all that behind when I came to America. It's a consequence of colonialism that nobody encouraged me to keep up the little Arabic I'd acquired. Levantines only spoke to servants in Arabic. What a crying shame, and one that lies behind so much angry ignorance and incomprehension and hostility today. The discomfort of the immigrants speaking the mother tongue is one thing. At home, it is a more humiliating prejudice, inculcated by the masters, absorbed in turn by the subalterns. Caliban, you taught me language, and my profit on it is I know how to curse. In Egypt, the issue became much sharper as the old powers lost their grip and the Arabophone nationalists grew in strength. When the new young king, Farouk, succeeded his father in 1936, he was welcomed with immense hope and joy because he was the first ruler of Egypt who spoke Arabic as his mother tongue. And the dismal disillusionment of his reign was exacerbated when he failed to live up to this patriotic promise. As an early sign of the changing times, after the coup of the free officers under the leadership of Gamal Abdel Nasser in 1952, French was banned for official business of any kind in Arabic, and Arabic established in its place. Amnesia has taken over these interminglings of the past, yet Arabic used to be spoken and written in Europe, and not only in Andalusia and Spain, but in Sicily. Before civil conflict between rival emirs, there weakened Muslim power and gave the Norman Franks, who had coexisted with their Arab predecessors for a century, the chance to take over the whole of the island. For a time, the cultural conversation and coexistence continued, with Moorish artisans, as I showed you before, working on the, on the magnificent monuments of the island, such as the Duomo in Monreale. Um, one of the literary forms that flourished in Sicily was the fable. And it continues vigorously to this day in the puppet plays, folklore, and other popular expressions of the Sicilians, transmitted across great stretches of time and across borders of language and religion. For example, Ibn Zafer, who traipsed around the shores of the Mediterranean, taking refuge in Egypt and then in Tunis and dying in exile in Syria, compiled a collection of moral tales and the tradition of animal fables of Karila Wadimna, with many allusions to the Quran Quranic parables as well, though his stories are novel inventions and variations on the traditional plots. He gave the work the title Resources of a Prince Exposed to the Hostility of His Subjects in order to claim proverbial wisdom's functions to warn, give counsel, protect, and console. In the 1852 English translation of the Italian edition by Michele Amari, the title is Sol One, or The Waters of Comfort, and the author offers a most seductive gloss. Sol One is the plural of Solwana, the name of a shell, concerning which the Arabs believe that if a little water is poured upon it and given to drink to one who is in love, he will immediately recover. <laughs> So these, um, these, immense, these are immense, this is a, a wonderful story um, of a princess who can't laugh or smile, um, a very characteristic opening topos of a fairy tale, and her father, who grieves that she's so distressed, um, tries to make her cheer her up and gives her a bird. The bird sings and she cheers up, but then the bird becomes melancholy because it doesn't like being in a cage. So then there's a solution, which I won't tell you, because I'm going to, but it's a, ha a fairy tale solution. There are also numerous, uh, very ingenious uh, Machiavellian. He's been compared, um, Ibn Zafer has been compared to Machiavelli in, in the cunning that he shows in his uh, political analyses of how rulers should behave and survive. I don't find him quite as vicious as Machiavelli, actually. I find him more humane. Um, but um, j just to, to pick up this idea of these um, imbricated patterns that actually, as it were, abolish or create very long temporalities that flatten it onto a, simple, onto a surface, um, the greatest of the Italian fabulists is, of course, Calvino. And Calvino um, combed all the provincial libraries to collect up this tradition of Italian um, fabulism and did a, the most beautiful, beautiful job of it. Um, 
a great one of the great books, and he and he also it turned him around himself as a, from a, from realism to fabulism as his own, for his own work. And one of the, the two two of the people whom he drew on um, were both Sicilian uh, collectors of fables. So I'm not going to give you much detail on this because we're running out of time. But just I just wanted to keep to keep this to show, give you this in mind to show you these very long traces and genealogies because these stories are recognizably, I mean, I'm not a you know, structural folklorist, but these stories are recognizably uh, variations, computations, permutations of motifs that are found in India, in, um, you know, in the, in the, definitely in the Arabian Nights and so forth. And you also get, I mean, I noticed last night in the film at the exhibition, someone singing in a beautiful, deep, sort of throaty voice that he hears a sirena cacanta, but I couldn't see the credit for the, for the singer. Anyway, the sirena is a f feature. She features in the Arabian Nights. She features, she features in the puppet plays of, of Sicily, which continue to, of course, tell the stories um, of the, uh, the Arthurian cycle and the Orlando cycle. The, um, I'll just go back. That, this, this was a very important female collector who actually spread the stories um, from Sicily, where she collected them in Messina, uh, to Germany because she was actually the daughter of the Swiss German consul and she wrote them down in German. She collected them verbatim but translated them to German. So they actually then migrated north and, and turn up in much of the German fairy tale material as well. So this kind of, again, entanglement in trecciamento. One of the most important figures um, who also um, joins up the Middle East um, and is still very vigorous in the Middle East um, and appears in all the Sicilian material and is still much the subject of children's plays and children's fairy tales is Jufa, who in Arabic is Hodja. So these, um, these, um, these, these connections are, are, are very um, rich and important. Um, so um, just now the final. Okay, so... Um, one of the most handsome and least dilapidated books in my mother's possession when she died was this collection of Trilusa's fables. Published in the year of her birth, it but brought in, brought in Cairo, as the page before the title page proper bears something written in Arabic in pencil, and the whole volume has been cloth bound in Cairo with the title Italian poems inscribed in gold on the spine. But the contents aren't exactly Italian poems, as Trilusa's verse fables, uh, animal fables, are written in the Roman dialect that has made him now the beloved poet laureate of Trastevere. You probably all know this, it's just around the corner, that wall across the river. Um, so we live in a country of words, Mahmoud Darwish has right, written in a famous poem about exile and homesickness. My mother brought a form of knowledge with her from Italy in her head, a literary genre that's mostly conveyed orally, to which she became more and more attached as she realized that while it was said well, what was said, what, what proverbs say and fables say are common to humanity, the Italians say it in a particular way with a special flair. She collected proverbs all her life whenever she heard one in English or other language, and she sought its Italian rendering. Trilusa's favore includes several animal tales of cunning, deceit, consent, countering the abuses of raw power the archives of an underdog who lives in hope and sees things clearly even when the world is going to hell in a handcart or a Rolls Royce. My mother has marked several places in the book. Um, one poem that she liked has a couplet which says, e la prima speranza è sempre quella d'essere capito da una donna bella. And I'm afraid that that was one of the areas where she definitely thought that her strength lay in her great beauty, as you probably saw. Um, but a few years after she, before she died, she was able to publish a selection from her long, patient archaeology of proverbial wisdom. And I think that um, it's actually interesting that the illustrator, um, yeah, so, and the illustrator um, caught the sort of Britishness of her, of her masquerade. So, so here, the sort of blimp, blimp the blimp who is, um, has returned. Um, proverbs are miniature stories, often comic, cautionary tales, saturated in world weariness about the ways of the strong against the weak, the ruthlessness of the powerful, the stupid trustfulness of ordinary people, and the cunning, sometimes, of others. Often casting animals as the protagonists, the form seems to go back to the beginning of our species. And Compendia traveled the globe. The tales are, 
we call Aesop's, predate these Greek variants in the Panchatantra in Sanskrit and reappear with variations in Kalila Wadimna in Arabic and are revisioned with dazzling malice by La Fontaine, who returns the proverb to its narrative frame. Their age-old Eastern wisdom, hard-headed and rueful, makes you smile and then leaves a bittersweet aftertaste. Finally, the last book. Um, Giuseppe Novello, a caricaturist, Che cosa, che cosa dirà la gente? Published 1937, year 16, the same author also published Il Signore di Buona Famiglia, and he satirized, which went through five editions and was published in a luxury edition bound in canvas, as this one is too. Um, so these, these are cartoons about the pressures of social norms and the disillusion of married life. They carry a very strong component of raw misogyny. Um, and in the volume of Trilusa, my mother marked the place at a story poem called La Pupazza, which is not a traditional fable either, but a wistful reminiscence on the part of the poet of a childhood transgression when he secretly took out his sister's gorgeous china clockwork doll, La squartai come un pollo, poverella. I quartered her like a chicken, poor little thing. The poem closes, ever since then, if I see a girl who looks around her and sighs, even though I feel a tira tira, I don't know if that means a tug of desire, does it? Tira tira. Um, non me posso scordare della, della pupazza. I can't forget that great doll. The lions stand as a piercing comment on the conventions that stifled girls and women of, my, of the generation of my mother and Fausta Celente before her belong to. In what is her finest story? In my view, Pamela o la bella estate, written in Alexandria in 37, Fausta Celente brings before us a slow, all-absorbing and poignant transgression as her heroine, a young Venetian who has married a penniless and beautiful Armenian photographer and quickly had two children, is shocked into self-discovery when the family are forced by poverty to rent their home one summer and move into its stifling basement. It's a metaphor of the suffocating world of proprieties in which she finds herself a prisoner. A gaggle of artists move in. This is very much the sort of Parisian <coughs> a, a, a glamorous world that's evoked by all that French. In the, um, and parties in their garden and in their house every night. Chalente observes her heroine as she watches secretly the louche, pleasure-loving, spendthrift, sensual crowd, French in their tastes and insouciant in their confidence and she opens her up to a sense of possibilities and other worlds of knowledge, like opening up a lovely, innocent doll to see what is inside her. My mother arrived in Cairo and was inducted into a British imperial dream in its last moments, although, unfortunately, the British imperial dream seems to be staging some kind of a comeback. Um, the bookshop was burned down in 1952, in the nationalist uprisings against foreign-owned businesses, which brought NASA and the free officers to power. One of the things inside us um, in, that, are, that we can open up are the stories of our lives, but also of others' lives and thoughts, from the books we read or even only hear about. Um, they are, these books are wanderers, and the stories in them often impeded, but nevertheless defying constraints. Occupying those forms, taking them in directions you want, can move us beyond borders and reveal patterns of engagement and conversation, paths of alternative desire. Thank you. Absolutely fascinating uh, exploration of the webs of the transcultural and for the um, exploration of positionality throughout. Um, we have time for just a couple of questions um, before we move to the performance. So, would anyone like to ask a question? Laura Dana? For one thing, uh, thank you uh, also for that wonderful, illuminating, but also extremely personal 
journey through memory. And, and in a sense, that's what I would like to take mostly from, from this, how personal memory, historical memory, family memory are also woven. I take that, that, that metaphor of, of, you know, Calvino's metaphor of the texture, of the tessitura, which is one that I go back to all the time. I also think of his beautiful essay on the tappeto persiano, you know, and again, Absolutely. which goes back to that, your image of the arabesque. It's one that I keep going back to. And for me, that has become also memory of, uh, uh, a metaphor of translation, of how translation is deeply woven into our lives. Mm. But I would like you perhaps to talk very briefly about the sense in which memory is also the texture of what you've been talking about. Um, well, actually, of course, I should have mentioned the exhibition because uh, you've even got uh, just books in the memories of the, I mean, the, the books they carried with them in their memories of the, all down the corridor there. So that was, I mean, and the objects too. I mean, I've, I've been writing this book, sort of trying to reconstruct my parents' lives in Cairo, so it is a book of memory. But I have, um, I, I have developed a kind of uh, a chairiness about uh, the emphasis on memory um, in, the, it, because in relation to the situation of the refugees. Um, because there are many, many ways of telling stories. And at the moment, such an emphasis is being placed, and, and this is, I think, not entirely conscious. It's, it's driven by forensic and legal requirements that the arrivants, as I prefer to call them, um, have to give their story. And then they mustn't change it. So they're not allowed, actually, the, the usual vicissitudes of memory. They have to be Euclidean and clear and barrier-like in how they remember. You know, and this, um, I mean, I think there are m many problems with this. One is, I think that the I that we now occupy is a, very much a historical moment of, the, of subjectivity, and we need to be aware of that. This is not a kind of permanent truth-telling tribunal. Um, this is a way in which we explore contemporary subjectivities, and it goes back to the Romantics to some extent, but possibly to Montaigne. But it is a definite, it is a definite cultural uh, artifact. It's not, um, and the emphasis on it is, is, is leeching out the narrative possibilities. Um, there are, there, you know, I mean, there are the animal fables. There, there are, um, you know, there are fairy tales. There, are, there is science fiction. There is satire. There are songs. There is rudeness, which children are very good at, inventing rude songs. Um, and all these things, and these, this, there's an absolute cordon sanitaire around these, these forms if you're an arrivant. You cannot make a joke. You try to go up to a border guard and make a joke. So you're, but you can go up to a border guard and make a traumatic statement. And so it seems to me that there's a, that, that there's a, a loss of understanding of the, of the vicissitudes of narrative. And, but there's also, and I think, I mean, this is a sort of dangerous territory, because I know that a lot of the people working on these stories and so forth are very, very much on the side of the people. They don't want to help them. The lawyers are very, many, many very good lawyers, you know, really trying to get them to get the statement right so they will get their papers. Um, this, this, they want to help them. But it, there is a kind of spectacle here of, you know, there's a kind of, a, a kind of glib commiseration on our part. Um, and there's a kind of um, spectacle of horror in which we are somehow, you know, we shed a few tears, but, you know, it's, so I, I sort of, I, 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 I mean, they're obviously wonderful writers of memory. I mean, Sebald is a fantastic writer of memory, but he's very unreliable. So if he were, you know, he's not the model that the refugee is allowed. So, um, so I have very, as you see, I have very mixed feelings. And this project that Charles mentioned in Sicily um, is actually trying to encourage memories that are of ways of telling stories, rather than this, the request to avow. Oh, so I'll say two more things about the, the avowal and memoir, if that's okay. And, and that is that the model is, the actual uh, model behind it is actually the pardon tale which Natalie Demon Davis wrote about very brilliantly, um, in which you actually succeed. That's very much the model for the amnesty seeker. You know, you tell a story well enough that will get you past the legal barriers. That's the same as the pardon tale. And then the other one is the slave narrative. 
And the slave narrative was a very, very effective weapon for abolition, excellent weapon. And they are marvelous narrative acts. Um, but, you know, refugees, it's, uh, anyway, you can see that there's a sort of globalization of the, mem of the, of the first person memoir that's perhaps been a little unexamined, in my view. Adal Jesus, just very briefly. Uh, yes. Sorry. Um, I'll I'll go he's bringing them. Briefly. He's bringing the microphone. Um, I'd like to ask you what stories did you read um, <laughs> when you were a kid in Cairo, and what kind of um, you know how did did the books that your mother took with her? Um, you know, linked with your own. Well, books I have no memory of any of these books until she died. I mean, and they're, I don't think she sort of, you know, she didn't particularly cherish them, but she didn't throw them away. I, I just, I mean, I just took from her books, of which she had many, I mean, I just took the ones of the right date that meant that they predated her, her leaving Italy, or, or just after her leaving Italy. But, um, it, uh, you know, I was, I'm a child of a bookseller. <laughs> I spent my life on the floor of the bookshop. I read everything. I was not, no, no, nothing was forbidden. When I, when I first went to boarding school at the age of nine, the nuns confiscated every book I'd brought with me. <laughs> I had gone with the wind, Rebecca. Yeah, I didn't understand them, but I loved reading. And I, and I got, you know, there were images. There were bits of things that I could gather. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sadly, we have to move from one exploration of a whole series of literary, non-literary um, identifications, stories, dreams, imaginings, um, both personal and macro, to another form of representation. We are, of course, in this project partners of the British School at Rome, and it's appropriate to mention also that um, Marina is Deputy Chair of Council of the British School at Rome. But I'd like to stop well, I'd like, unfortunately, to, to, to end a session which could go on for a very long time, and I'm sure will go on informally. But I'd like um, to thank Marina once more for an absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you.